All right, good afternoon, everyone. Any questions? All right, so what I'd like to do today is finish lecturing on chapter two, and then we'll pick up the lab again where we left it off last time for, for lack of time. Um, <coughs> I, so I, I looked, uh, I got a whole bunch of homework submissions, and so I had a very brief look at it, and it'll take me a couple of days to plow through that. I will post homework two part B, or whatever the, the naming is, uh, this, this evening. The basic idea of homework of, of that is to actually implement that messaging system and to draw a sequence diagram and to write a little bit of text. Um, <clears throat> one thing I noticed with with this part A is I asked for a document that that explained uh, that asked some questions you know, how how you arrived at the, the thinking that you had, and I didn't see that with everyone. So um, I'll be asking the same thing for, uh, for the next homework. So be sure to include that. <clears throat> so let's get, get to the slides here. Yes, yeah. So the design of the pattern some of the tendencies dependent on, or depended on how, how we want to design it. Now, there's no correct or... There is no totally correct or incorrect thing. So what I'm going to do when grading is I'm going to have a look at all of these things and say, oh my god, how am I going to grade this? Um, so realistically, if I find something that is obviously inconsistent or undoable or completely vague, then I will point that out. And so otherwise, I may just, just roll over and play dead and give you four points. Um, so uh, it's, as you've seen yes, uh, on, what, two days ago when, when we looked at some of these diagrams, it is a very squish, squishy thing, what's right and what's wrong. Um, the hope is that you know, sometimes one finds things that are definitely wrong. Then I could point that out, and then that, that would be a learning experience for you. Um, <clears throat> it it is very difficult to, to to do these things completely right, as you will notice when you do the implementation. So I will ask you to implement according to the the design that you have come up with in the first part of the homework. And the question that I'm going to ask you to to, to reflect on is. Where did you have to make changes to the design? Or where was what you ended up implementing inconsistent with the design that you came up with? And I think almost all of you will find that when you, when you look back from the implementation that you have that actually worked to the design that you came up with, that they did not completely match up. That is kind of normal. Yeah. Oh, uh, <clears throat> another thing that, that now comes to mind is um, sometimes and this may be the case here because there's some transfer students, if you've taken our 46A and 46B, you have long learned that there's no hope to get 100% of anything, right? That there's always going to be something where it's, it's challenging, and, uh, and that's normal. So we're not trying, in general, to drive people to 100% score. Um, if you get an 80% score but you've learned a lot, then that's worth much more than getting 100% and not having learned a little. And the same thing is true in this class. So there will be many, many times when you open up your, your uh, grade thing and it's, it says, eh, and you got yeah, points off taken here, points off taken there. And that's fine. You will still get an A if you uh, make a whole bunch of mistakes. Um, but I feel it's better if, if something isn't right, if that's honestly pointed out so that you can learn from that and then move on. So don't have the expectation that you, you have to get a perfect score every time. Um, in, <clears throat> in software engineering, no one ever gets a perfect score, I think. Um, so there's always something that one could have done better. All right, so I wanted to finish up the book chapter. So let's see how far we've gotten. Multiplicities, inheritance, use cases. CRC cards. Sequence diagrams. So <clears throat> when you have a bunch of CRC cards and you have some class diagrams <clears throat> and you kind of wonder, you know, is this good enough? Is this really going to be a design that can be translated to code? There's one other useful exercise that one can do is, and that is you take your most complicated scenario the one that 
you think is really confusing or unclear or um, where things could are likely to go wrong, and then you say, well, how does it actually work? Which object is going to say what to which other object? And what's that other object going to do? And what is the sequence of, uh, of method calls, really, that, that happen to carry out that difficult task? You can do it for a couple of difficult tasks, but it's a really good idea to do it for one. So the, <clears throat> the diagramming notation here is as follows, that you have here an object in the UML notation. The difference between a class and an object is that objects are underlined. Um, so here you see the, the underlined thing here means this is an object, a specific object. Um, if you want to indicate what class that object is of, you can do it with a colon and then the class name afterwards. If it's blindingly obvious, you don't have to do that. Then there is this block here, which means it's some amount of time is passing. So here, time is passing and some activity happens here at the mailbox. We don't quite know what that incoming activity is, but the mailbox is, is working on something. And as it's doing that, it then issues a method call add to this new messages thing. What is new messages? It's a message queue. So apparently it's going to be adding something to the message queue. We can't see here what the parameters are. The, there is no syntax for that. We can just see that the add method gets called. Now you could say from a design perspective, you know, in the design we're focusing on high level responsibilities and not necessarily method calls. And that's fine. If you have a high level responsibility, you get to add a message here with spaces in. Um, <clears throat> it, it really depends on how close you are to the final design um, of what you do. Um, generally, for beginners, I think it's easier to stay close to the code. Um, this high level stuff you know, is very nebulous and the, the more it's like actual code, I think the easier you're going to find this here. So add here, you know, let's think of it as calling the add method on the message queue. So you can think of it as the add responsibility on the message queue. <coughs> um, it, it doesn't make it, uh, a, a huge difference, but I think concrete, it makes it easier for you. Yeah? This colon here separates the name of the object from the name of the class. Um, and so this is because in, uh, in many programming languages, that's the syntax. You say object, colon, and then the type. It just happens that in C, C++, Java, it's the other way around. No, no, that just means that for the mailbox's object, it is so obvious what class it belongs to that we didn't write it down. So you can certainly have afterwards write colon mailbox. And but then you know what how much extra value do you add there? Whereas with new messages, you know, there was no good way of knowing what the heck is new messages. You know, in fact, I'm telling you it is a message queue object. Well, there are also, okay, so the purpose of a sequence diagram is not to show the entire design. The purpose of a sequence diagram is to go through a, speci a specific scenario. If in this scenario, the old messages never enter, you don't draw the old message. So I'll give you a, uh, a more interesting one in just a couple of minutes. I just wanted to go through the syntax. So what you see here is the, the method call syntax. Sometimes it happens that a, an object here calls a method on itself. Notice here, by the way, we're not giving the object a name. We're just saying colon mail system. That means mail system is the class. And somehow we know which object we're talking about. In this case, because there's only one mail system. Now, feel free to say my mail system, colon mail system, and when you make a diagram like that. But when you see other people omitting some of these obvious things, that, that's uh, legitimate. 
So here, this mail system is doing something. We don't yet know what because we don't have enough context. Um, <coughs> and then it needs to call a method on itself, namely to locate a mailbox. And so that means in the code, you would write this period locate mailbox or simply locate mailbox because the this period is optional. <coughs> That's just uh, the way that a self call looks like. And you know, it's pretty obvious the timeline lies on the same object. You see it's a little shifted to the right so that one can see what's going on. The third piece of syntax that you can sometimes will see is when a constructor is involved. So over here, the mail system, for whatever reason, creates a new mailbox. So you can see the create goes to the element that previously wasn't there. And then the element also gets a new timeline that right now there's nothing on it. But I'm guessing that what really is going to happen, this timeline is going to get longer, and then there'll be a call on this thing. So that's the third piece of syntax, the constructor invocation. We don't see the construction parameters. We just see the constructor. And the, <coughs> the create, uh, in, in the angle quotes, that's just a piece of the UML syntax. You're supposed to say create and not construct. Whatever. Okay, I don't want to talk about state diagrams. I want to show you an actual sequence diagram. So here we have an actual sequence diagram. Let's see if I can get this larger. And so the use case here is to leave a message. So we have this telephone object. Notice that it doesn't have a name. It is the telephone object that's somehow there. The telephone object then apparently has some user dialogue here where it asks the user to please enter the extension. And the user does that. We're not seeing that part here. Because this is some use, uh, this is just some call with system out and system in, or scanner, and so it's just put here as a comment. So the user enters the extension, and then what does the telephone do? <coughs> now the telephone calls the dial method on this connection class. That means that if I look at a CRC part of that connection. That would be really good if over here it said die. And if not, and truthfully, when one does this the first time, you know, it may not say this at all, then that's fine, then you need to go and fix up your, uh, your part. So there's now a dial method. So what does the dial method do? Well, presumably it gave the extension number and <coughs> the, the connection comes, uh, that, that does something. What does the connection do? Um, the connection wants to speak the greeting. That's what a connection does. When you call a dial, then it comes back with saying, you have reached this extension, blah, blah, blah. So the connection calls the speak method. Who knows how to speak to the user? All of the user interaction is done the telephone. So the telephone has the keypad, the simulated keypad, and the simulated speaker. And that's why this call goes this direction. So at some point, this the dialing part is done. Now, the telephone here then waits for user input. And we could denote this in another way, but here I've just done it with comments. And so now the user then speaks some message. And so when they speak that message, then it, <coughs> it gets captured by just, I, I don't remember, I think it's a loop that, that checks out the uh, console.next line or something. The message is assembled by the telephone as a simulated voice 
And then the telephone thing has the message and it calls record to the connection. And finally, the user hangs up. And that one calls hang up on the connection. Now what it says here, and I don't know how true that is, um, but we'll, we'll check the implementation later. It says here that when calling hang up, what now happens is that in the hang up method, the connection object creates a message. So that means that the connection object must somehow have logic in it that says whatever was recorded, what it knows from here, put that into a message. So it creates this method, and then it calls on the mailbox. The add message method. So let's cheat a little bit, and let's look at the code and see whether the code is actually in sync with this. Um, okay, let's look at the scenario. I understand your question. Um, give, give me a minute here. Let's get this one kicked off. So we're talking about the scenario, leave a message. So it's kind of helpful to have a look at that. Here's the use case. So here it says that the, t the telephone asks the connection to record the message. Oh, so um, those of you who, who are not really familiar with Eclipse, there's one thing, I, one Eclipse trick that I want to tell you. So we're, I'm going to be using Eclipse. You can use any IDE that you want, but you know, Eclipse is, is perfectly good. Um, there's a key part that beginning students often miss with Eclipse, and that is, so I now want to open the project that is in the book source code that has all the mail system stuff. And so when I started out, it looked like this. So the very first thing that I always do when I am in this create a project wizard whether it's an Eclipse or a NetBeans. They always have this weird setting where it says, use default location. You ever notice that? And that never made any sense to me because I've been coding for, what, 40 years? And there has never once been a case that I started from scratch. There was always some code from before. When's the last time you coded anything from scratch except for a homework? Even with the homework, right? Don't you get starter code? So, uh, so this setting, to so, so me, is always absurd. So you want to uncheck it, and you want to go to the place where the code is that you want to start with, um, which in our case is 151 code. Nope, not net, not yet. Chapter 2. Okay. Mail. Here we go. That's the code. And now it sets the project name to mail, whatever. I, I can deal with that. And now I can finish. So now we want to flip back and forth between the, the diagram here and our code. So let's find the telephone class. And let's see where in the telephone class this stuff happens. So this would probably be a really good idea for you to do the same thing. Open your Eclipse and so that, that you can read the code with me because it shows up probably extremely tiny on the screen right now. So when you look here in the telephone class, it has a method run here. Yes. 
So if you go to the, the course page, you go to textbook, and oops, I don't have it for download. Okay. Um, <laughs> I see, I see. Okay, then I'll have to give you another way of, of doing it. So right now, when you go to the textbook and where you see where it says ODP3, um, for, for today, just go to where it says ODP2, and there is a zip file here that you can take right now. Um, I'll, I'll put it up during the lab so that, that you have the latest and greatest. But right now, you can unzip this file here. So, like I said, so horseman.com slash ODP2 and then ODP.zip. And that's the, that's the previous version, so it's not quite as what you're going to get when I update the, uh, the thing. So I'm, I'm changing things to like Java 8 features. Um, and this, this one here is, I think, a Java 5. It's ancient. <clears throat> All right, so. So now I'm looking at this telephone class uh, here, and I do see that there is a speak. And I can see here that there is a dial. And so let's look at what the telephone does. Is it gets a character at a time, really. So when I uh, enter the phone number, if you remember from the demo, I entered it as one and then enter, and then seven and then enter, and then two or whatever. Uh, I think it was just two digits, right? One and one and then seven. And each time that a single character has been entered, dial gets called. So the telephone is really stupid. Now, when you look at this diagram here, notice that there's actually a loop. Dial gets called multiple times. But the loop is not shown. Because it is kind of high level. So there's a bunch of dials going on. And it's somehow to be understood that that happens more than one time. You could make multiple arrows if you like. But people do that. If, they're, if it happens in a loop and it's, if it's obvious which it must have been to whoever drew the sequence diagram, meaning me 10 years ago, um, then one just omits it. So now let's see what happens in this speak arrow here. So for that, we need to look at the connection. And here's the dial method. And the dial method here it apparently is very state dependent. Depending on which state you're in, it does different things. So that um, the telephone, like I said, is totally stupid. The telephone tries to be like a real telephone. When you push a button on the real telephone, the telephone has no idea why you're pushing the star key right now or the two key. It just sends the key to someone who knows. That someone who knows here is the connection. So this connection is a total artifact. It's not something that's, that appears naturally in life. This, the job of the connection is to remember in which state the system is in right now and to do the right thing when another telephone input comes. So we're now in the situation that we are I don't even know what state we're in. So we're at the beginning in the in the disconnected state apparently. Why? No, it's not used. Or 
Or are we in the connected state? Um, let's walk through this thing. So we're at run. We're calling dial, so we're disconnected. What I'm hoping to see is that the key that the keys get accumulated somewhere. So over here you see a string accumulated keys. And so as I type numbers, this accumulated keys here gets to be longer and longer. I see. So, so we must be um, right now in in this branch where it calls connect. Um, this is a call that we're not seeing in our diagram. So, if the key is a pound key, then something happens, and we'll see that in just a second. And otherwise, these accumulated keys just get longer. Now, when the pound key gets entered, that means that the user typed in the complete mailbox number, and now it calls your find mailbox. Are we seeing the call to find mailbox here? Here it is. So at this point, it has the complete number, and it feels compelled to find the mailbox. Then it asks the mailbox a question. It asks the mailbox, what is the greeting that you store? The mailbox stores the greeting in this design. And when we look at the code, you can see that here we're getting the mailbox by calling find mailbox. We're calling get greeting to get the greeting. And then we're asking the phone to speak because only the phone has a speaker. The connection doesn't have, doesn't have anything physical. And that's the arrow that you see back here. You can see what telephone speak does by going back to the telephone. And it just prints it because we don't have voice output in this program. But you could imagine an enhancement, like a 2.0 version of this little program, where we would actually have a microphone attached, where in record, we record the, uh, some voice through the microphone, and where in speak, we play it back through the speaker. It wouldn't change the overall system very much. Instead of text, we would have a voice file. Well, no, no, this is not even speech synthesis. This is, remember what happens when, when you call, like, your mom's phone, and it says, you know, um, in her voice, it says, you have reached the mailbox of whoever. And that's a file, right? How else does Verizon do that? I mean, it's, it's some file that has whatever she recorded at one point. And so here we're just simulating the file with text. But you could, with little effort, if you had an API for recording and for playing back voice files, you could just change the text to the file and do it that way. And the flow would be exactly the same. The phone would have a method to play a file. The phone would presumably have a method to record voice. And uh, the, the, the flow would be completely unaffected by this. So then over here, let's look at the, the record thing. Now the user wants to leave a message at this, at this voicemail. Um, So that's back at the telephone. And that is the case here. When see see we have this this dumb keyboard input where we are simulating the telephone. So we have to make it so that if the keys were pushed were not one to nine or zero to nine or the number key or the star key, which somewhere we're ignoring here or the special keys H was hang up and Q was to quit the program, then we're assuming it's voice. And if this was a physical system, we would probe the microphone and see if someone is speaking there or something. Um, but here we're saying whenever it's voice, we're just capturing the string as a text string, and we're passing it on to record. And so record 
now we're just storing the string. Um, you know, we could be recording voice if we knew how, how, to, how to do that in Java. And so let's see what record does. So record just depends the string to the current recording. So if someone does two or three lines worth of speak, then the current recording just gets longer and longer. Eventually, they're done with recording, and then they hang up. And that's what you see here. Then they hang up, and then all this other stuff happens. So let's see how that goes. That is, again, in the connection. And so we're looking for for hang up here. So here's hang up. And says, you know, we were currently recording. And so now we're, we're adding a message to the current mailbox. And namely, that's the message that's formed from the recording. Now you see there is a, uh, there's some state here. How do we know what the current mailbox is? That one was set previously over here and connect once the, the user has entered the pound key, which means that previously the, the accumulated keys were the number of the mailbox. The mailbox was found, and it's stored in this instance variable. And so you can see down here the instance variables that this connection object keeps. So it has, it remembers what's the current recording, what are the accumulated keys, what is the current mailbox, and all of that. So it's highly stateful. It needs to remember a lot of stuff because someone needs to. The phone is stupid. It's just a piece of plastic. Um, it's stimulated. And so this, this thing here remembers everything. And that is really how a voicemail system works because in a real voicemail system, the phone is on the other end of the world, right? It's, it's like your mom's phone. Whereas the computer that is the voicemail system at Verizon is you know, in some data center. And so the, something on that computer system needs to remember all of the keys that the, that the user pushed, all of the, the voice that came in. It's not the phone. It is the connection. So the separation here does, does make physical sense. So the point that I'm trying to make is that these sequence diagrams are non-trivial to do because you ha already have to have a pretty good idea how you want to implement the system. So in order to draw this diagram, you already have to understand in your mind what a telephone does and what a connection does. And this design decision that a telephone accumulates one key at a time and just as soon as it has a key, it sends it off to the connection. And the connection remembers the sequence of keys. You have to remember that the, that the connection somehow has an idea of what the current mailbox is. So it's not easy to draw these sequence diagrams. And when drawing them, they really tell you a lot of what must already go on. It is highly unlikely that the first sequence diagram that you're drawing will be very good. Because um, if you have not yet done the implementation, there's all these assumptions and missing assumptions that, that make it really challenging to do that. Um, but it's nevertheless an instructive thing to do. So any questions about the, the, the syntax of the sequence diagrams? Are, any, are there any arrows or shapes or anything that are confusing? Yeah? Why are so the, the little rectangle marks and rectangles that comes out, vertical rectangles, why are they separated in some places like the report is separated? Ah, OK, very good. So, so the, the leftmost one in a sequence diagram is, a, is generally a continuous timeline because you're analyzing a call to an object. And so someone called, and the, the, we can find out which call it is actually here because we have the code. Uh, the method is run. So right now we're in the run method, and that run method is happening. And so this timeline here is therefore completely continuous. Um, now, inside the run method, there's a couple of calls to dial that I've drawn here as a single arrow. And then later, there's a couple, there's, it could be several calls to record if there's more than one line. And then there's a call to hang up. And now one takes each of these calls and looks at what happens in that call. Let's look at the call to dial. The call to dial is this continuous line here. 
and it consists of these two calls. So let's look at the first call to find mailbox. That call here happens somewhere in the mail system. The mail system has a set of mailboxes. So what find mailbox will do is it's been given a mailbox number and it finds the mailbox. It doesn't have to call any other object to do that. It just looks inside itself and finds the mailbox. So that one here happens and then it's open. And so notice that there's no return. There's no arrow going backward. The return is implicit. When this thing ends, then we return back in. And then the next call here is get greeting. You can see it happens afterwards because the time flies, uh, flows downwards and uh, the extent of the time here is different than from here. So after find mailbox has returned, get greeting gets called. Then the third call here is the call to speak. That happens to go backwards here, but you know, it could have otherwise gone to some other, uh, somewhere else. And sp when speak is over, then the call to, to dial is over. And we're back here, but we're now calling record, which is simple. And then we're calling hang up, which is more complex. It makes a construction and an address. So that's how you read it. Yeah? Um, so for the mailbox, the get find mailbox and get greeting, are they called in connection or the mailbox? So why is get receiving in your uh, mail system and find mailbox like between the two? Like, ah, how okay. Do you, like, All right. So, the, so, here the, so here we are inside this the, the dial method of connection and so the connection now calls find mailbox it's object oriented so it must call it on some object and so when we look at the code here we are in sorry what method in dial connection So we're in dial. We're not seeing that we're actually inside connect um, because I guess we didn't know that yet when we went wrong in the diagram. So we're inside here. And now over here it says system.findMailbox. So what is system? It tells me here by mousing over. It's a mail system. So it invokes the findMailbox method on this mail system object. And when you see over here, you see that findMailbox is on called on a mail system object. So this, this syntax here, wherever the arrow ends up, well, then you go in the top and you see what that is. That is the receiver object, the object on which you call the method. Yes? Um, so you just said we don't see the main connection. I guess the proper way to draw that is to want to draw it and call to connect. Yeah, so, and this is again where how much uh, do you want to draw? I mean, it's it was an implementation decision to make dial call five other helper methods. Right. And that was not that, that was not necessary from the design. Could be, you could have you could have put them all into one method with a long if else. So for this, it might even be easier to just instead of putting dial as a label, put connect. And that's well, the, it, got the thing is, connect is is presumably a private method, yeah. right? So that's so, so yeah. So you you can't refer to to that. So and the fact that it is a private method tells you that it's an implementation artifact. Okay, other question about the syntax. <clears throat> so the easy question is, you know, what, what, does this, what does this mean? The hard question is, how do you draw one of these? And that is, as you will find out in a few minutes, genuinely hard. So what I want you to do for, for the rest, uh, for the next half hour, is join hopefully the same team that you had last time. And <clears throat> you had already forged ahead and made a UML diagram, a UML class diagram. What I want you to do is to do the index cards, the CRC card process. I have index cards for you. And write up those index cards with the names and responsibilities that you think are the right one. And then pick a scenario. And, and write a draw a sequence diagram for that scenario that is compatible with your CRC cards. So this, uh, and I think the the most reasonable scenario to play through is uh, where the instructor makes a clicker question, where then the students ask 
uh, where then the students answer the clicker question and the instructor sees how many students have already answered it. So try to shoehorn that flow into a sequence diagram and then we'll all look at see how they look. Okay?